Right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Healthy Happy Places Suicide Prevention by Design. This is the sixth in our webinar series, uh, and we're sharing work from the public health, planning, design, and, and the planning and design community. And everyone's welcome to our webinar. So I'm pleased to say we've got a, a vast number of people. I think we're into the hundreds here uh, at today's event. Um, Suicide prevention is a really important uh, matter for us to discuss in the context of healthy, happy places. Um, you know, it's reached epidemic proportions uh, as, a, as an issue in our society. And I think it's really important we talk about it, although we are very aware of the sensitivities around it and people may have been touched recently by suicide. We have got some helpful resources as well that will be actually in today's presentation as well. But at the end of the day, you know, the 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 situation we're in with suicide at a population scale it's just not okay and the built environment has got a large contribution to play in terms of you know keeping people supported um you know at, before any sort of crisis happens through a crisis and then ultimately in recovery um so my name is timothy david crawshaw i'm uh, the chair for today's webinar uh, i'm an international planning and development consultant um, and I'm chair of the Tees Valley Nature Partnership. Until next Wednesday, I am the president of the Royal Town Planning Institute too, and I am the co-lead for Healthy Happy Places with Dr. Rachel Turnbull, who is our program manager for Lead for Healthy Happy Places and the Lead for the Integrated Care System, the North East and North Cumbria Mental Health Evidence and Evaluation Group, and the Academic Health Science Network for the North East and North Cumbria, who will be talking to you shortly about our program. So. A little bit of housekeeping. Please ensure your microphone and video are turned off during the session. Uh, if you need to take a break, that's absolutely fine. Just drop off the call, come back, use the same link, get back in again. Live captions are available if required. The event has been recorded and will be shared. Please ask any questions you have through the chat facility. We have Holly on the, on the phone, so to speak, but use the chat facility and we will try and address those questions throughout the event. And if we don't manage to do this, we will follow up. We're really good at that. If you can't see the chat, please email your questions to holly.fillingham at cntw.nhs.uk. Join the conversation on Twitter, hashtag Healthy Happy Places. Speaker presentations and the recording will be circulated following the event. So next up, I give you, oh no, this is it. So this is today's agenda, sorry. So today's agenda, uh, we've got some fantastic speakers today. I'll introduce each one as we go through. Um, and um, off we go. Rachel, tell us all about it. Hi everyone and welcome to the session. Uh, so I'm Rachel, um, co-lead with Tim on Healthy Abbey Places. Um, I'm just going to run through very quickly in the interests of time to give more time to our speakers. Just a little bit about the programme, what we're about, um, how we do things and some of the lenses that we try and look through when we're thinking about design of places and spaces. Um, so essentially what we're looking at is how we can support and create mental health and well-being um, through the built environment. So how do we think about um, the way interiors, exteriors are designed, but also all the spaces in between as well. Importantly, we want to use a multi-sector approach um, to this. So we are funded by both the Academic Health Science Network and the integrated care system. So for anybody who's not from health, of which there are probably a number of people on this call who aren't from health because we have a mixed audience. Um, so these are both health related organisations and commissioning organisations too. Um, the HSN is about innovation in healthcare and how we can do things differently. So this programme itself is, is widening that out a lot further. Um, thinking about how we can share knowledge and expertise between not just health, but across public health, architecture and design, the arts and creative sector, planning and regeneration, and then citizens themselves too. And very much thinking about areas of inequalities. Um, so we're focused geographically here in the Northeast and North Cumbria, uh, but of course these webinars are, are open to anyone um, nationally and internationally. Next slide, please. So we tend to operate in a very place specific way. So some of our projects or all of our projects are very much based on um, a very specific um, location, whether that's inside a building, outside, or like I say, the spaces around. We're focused on people and communities um, and how to influence change where there's community activation about the buildings and the spaces in between and importantly, both based on evidence. Next slide, please. So some of the lenses we are 
trying to apply in our projects that we're doing on the ground um, it is presented here. So I'm not going to go into detail about all of these, but um, you can see that, you know, having places and spaces that are trauma informed, they're neurodiverse aware, dementia friendly, and they're enabled through that community activation and ownership. Um, arts and creative, we work or trying to work a lot with in terms of engagement and also creation of interventions. And then biophilic, which is essentially about how we use nature in design. So how can we mimic forms of nature? And there's a lot of evidence um, around that. Next slide, please. Um, and just lastly, to say this is one of a series of, of events that we run. So these are our previous um, webinars. They're all available on our web pages. Um, which we will share in the chat. Um, and our next one, next webinar, will be on um, trauma informed placemaking and places of sanctuary. So if you signed up to our mailing list, you will get notification of that one happening in March, hopefully. Thanks very much. That's all from me. Thanks, Rachel, that's a great, that's a great introduction to our um, our um, our programme here. Um, so it's been my great pleasure to introduce our first guest speakers. Well, we have Suicide Safer Communities, Every Life Matters, North East and North Cumbria Suicide Prevention Network. And we've got Mike Confrey, Public Health Locality Manager, South Lakeland Public Health, and Chris Wood, Charity Manager and Suicide Safer Communities Lead, Every Life Matters. So the floor is yours, gents. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, I think I've taken control. Hopefully that's OK. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Conifree, as Tim said. Um, I work for Cumbria County Council and whilst I have a broad public health lead in the South Lakeland area, I also lead for public health, mental health across the county and in that role lead on um, suicide prevention for the public health team. I propose to take only a couple of minutes of your time before handing on to my colleague from Cumbria, Chris, who I'm sure will be far more interesting than me. But I just want to quickly run over some key headline data on um, suicide in the UK. Um, uh, you may need to take back control because I can't get it to run forward, Sarah. Is that? Great, could you? Um, that's great. We'll start with that slide. Um, just a few slides. I popped up in this first slide some key sources of uh, information, data around suicide. When you get the pack, the links that are attached here should help you um, just if, if you want to dig out more information around suicide data uh, across the UK. The uh, National Confidential Inquiries run by, uh, led by Professor Louis Appleby at Manchester University, um, Office for Public Health and Disparities, uh, used to be Public Health England, we use their fingertips profiles, quite useful, and there was a useful pub House of Commons library briefing released towards the end of last year that you might find interesting. Um, one of the things to remember with suicide, some of the data is a little out of date because frequently we're waiting for coronial verdicts before we can say definitively that something was a suicide. Uh, if you could take the next slide, please. Um, so, uh, National Confidential Inquiry reports that there were nearly 67,000 suicides in the 10 years from 2009 to 2019 in the UK, an average of just over 6,000 a year. That's what a crowd of 6,000 people looks like. People tend to think of suicide or associate it with mental health problems. Confidential Inquiry tells us that only 27% of those people dying by suicide have been in contact with mental health services, specialist mental health services in the previous 12 months. Unfortunately, we don't have the denominator, but our estimates are about 5% of the population may be in touch with mental health services in any year. So while it's a high proportion of people with mental health problems who are likely to die by suicide, they still don't make up the bulk of people uh, who and their life in that means. Next slide. So suicide rates over time, so this is looking back uh, over 40 years. Uh, suicide rate in England and Wales has fallen. It's fallen by about 28% since 1981, but most of that decline was before 2000. Um, the rate in 2021, in fact, was higher than most years since 2005. So we haven't seen that decline 
continue for the last 10 years or so, perhaps counterintuitively as well. It's notable that there was a, a reasonable drop in the suicide rate during the first year of the pandemic, 2020, uh, and we saw locally significant drops actually during the first lockdown. That may be to do with protective factors. People who, who were at home had the support of their family around them, didn't have stresses associated with going out to work and so forth. We don't really know the answers. I'm afraid classically this data throws up more questions than answers. Um, next slide, please. Suicide rates differ significantly between men and women. Men are about three times more likely to die by suicide than females. Um, suicide males amongst the suicide rates amongst males, whilst having declined since 1981, haven't seen the same percentage of uh, reduction as that for females, where we've seen the rate drop by about 50%. So the key point here, I suppose, is recognising that males are at greater risk of suicide than females. The next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows um, suicide rates by age and gender. Um, it emphasises again the point that males are more likely to die by suicide. Middle-aged men remain and have been for some years the group most at risk of suicide. Um, Rates amongst adult men start to fall from the age of 65 to about 84. And then we see a fairly sharp rise in uh, males 85 and above. And younger and um, middle-aged women seem to be the, those at greatest risk of suicide. Next slide, please. Uh, these next two slides, I think, are interesting and touch on the issue that was measured, measured about disparity and deprivation and its role in suicide. What this slide shows in the grey bars is suicide rates by region uh, in the three year period 1981 or two, three years 81 to 83, uh, and then again in the period 2018 to 20. Frequently, we measure suicide rates over two or three year periods to try and iron out any statistical blips whilst the numbers are much higher than we'd want them to be they're still relatively small numbers and, and a, a blip in one year can throw the figures i think what's fascinating here is in that 40 year period the um change in suicide rates particularly in london um and this pattern now i haven't oops sorry previous slide sorry can we go back a slide yeah, uh, I haven't done the data on this, but looking at these regions, I would suggest that we've seen in that 40 year period um, a kind of alignment of suicide rates with deprivation. Certainly the northeast is one of the most deprived parts of the country, along with Yorkshire and Humberside um, and the east, southeast and, and London amongst the more affluent areas. I think that's that's really fascinating. If we do go on to the next slide now, I'd like to just explore that a little further. This slide shows um, data for on the left period 2013 to 2015 and 2017 to 2019. This is drawn from PHE fingertips, Public Health England fingertips. Um, the grey bar, the uh, grey horizontal bar is the average suicide rate for England as a whole, where the Horizontal bars are coloured red. They're significantly different at 95% confidence interval to the national picture, significantly worse, higher in this case, where they're green, they're significantly lower. And what's fascinating here, and this surprised us at the time, and um, the 2013-15 data we got in 2017, so since it's 35 years old for us, it's almost a classic bell curve now, not significant at the lower end, but what we see is suicide rates higher amongst those in areas of middle affluence. So what we're looking at here is uh, lower super output areas there, small geographies of two to three thousand households um, with uh, two, three thousand people, sorry. Um, and they're grouped into deciles, so that the 10 most deprived lower, lower super output areas are those that are described as most deprived and the 10 most affluent and least deprived. But back in 2013-15, the pattern of suicide seemed to be more prevalent amongst those in middle income areas. There seemed to be some protective fact factors in less affluent areas and certainly protective factors in those more affluent areas. In that five year period, We've seen a dramatic change, not dissimilar to that with this when we look at the regions, 
terms of the correlation with suicide and deprivation. That association with deprivation is seen across almost all forms of morbidity, ill health and all forms of, of premature mortality, early death. Um, that wasn't the case in suicide some years ago, but increasingly it's becoming the case. I don't have answers as to why that is. I just have more questions, I'm afraid. Could we go on to the next slide, please? Um, and just a couple of slides on method. The most common method um, for suicide has been for a long time and remains hanging, and the number of people dying uh, by suicide through hanging has increased over the last 10 years. Self-poisoning remains steady as the second most common method and jumping or multiple injuries. Now, these, these are people jumping or, or stepping in front of trains is, is not uncommon. Um, so quite often public uh, and quite brutal methods for people to die by suicide. That remains steady and it's the most um, third most common method. And the next slide, please. Less common methods, but other methods. Um, Drowning is the fourth most common method. Um, these days, cutting and stabbing has increased and has surpassed um, gas inhalation. So that's the um, that'll be the fourth and fifth uh, most common method. And use of firearms has fallen over the years as a method by which people die by suicide. It's more prevalent in rural areas such as Cumbria, where there is a, a larger farming community uh, with easier access to firearms. Access to firearms is one of the areas that we work on a lot. And then finally, last slide please. Um, next slide please. A suicide rate amongst people under 18. Um, there has been a decline, but that, that decline is, we've seen a decline in the last couple of years up to 2019. Suicide rates amongst under 18s had been rising. It was a big rise in 2017. It's worth noting that amongst under 18s, um, the balance is about the same between gender. So it's about 50 50 um, females and males who take their life at that age. Um, and a self harm is a very strong, it's an indicator of the propensity to suicide across all age groups, but it's a particularly strong indicator amongst people under 18. That's probably all it, you need from me before I pass over to Chris. I would encourage you to use the links on the first slide to explore or in greater detail the data that's available around suicide. And thank you all very much. Chris. Thanks, Mike. Um, we're going to look now at a, a very local level of community um, suicide prevention activity in Cumbria. My name is Chris Wood and I'm uh, one of the founders and charity manager of Every Life Matters. And we're a um, suicide prevention and suicide bereavement support charity operating uh, across Cumbria, the county of Cumbria. Um, we formed three years ago uh, really to take a long term approach to trying to reduce suicide rates in the county. Reducing suicide is a, a really complex and, and multifaceted issue. There isn't one easy answer really. So just looking at, uh, at some of the possible ways we go about reducing suicide, certainly tackling stigma, as Mike said, around 27% um, of people are in contact with mental health services at the time they die, or, or, or sorry, in the year leading up to when they die, it's much less at the time they die. Most people experiencing thoughts of suicide and going on to complete suicide um, are not reaching out for help, and we need to start um, enabling much more open conversations around not just mental health, but around thoughts of suicide, which are actually a lot more common than we give it credit for. Around one in five of us will have thoughts of suicide in our lifetime, around one in 17 of us in any given year. So there's a shift we need in our, our culture around um, acknowledging these, these thoughts and feelings and seeking help. Um, Postvention, which is a broad term for supporting those bereaved or impacted by suicide, who are a particularly high risk group. We, we, we come across a lot of families in Cumbria where there's multi-generational suicide or suicide, many suicides within the same generation. So really important group of people to work with. Um, around 40% will have thoughts of suicide in, in six months after they lose someone to suicide and 8% of people who are bereaved by suicide um, we'll make an attempt in the six months after that loss. 
Um, same for services. Um, so again, you know, not not that many people are reaching out for mental health support um, or service support when they're having thoughts of suicide. But where they do, it's really important. We've got um, very clear pathways in place. It's it's easy to access these services, and that the services are compassionate and able to manage risk. Um, and that's been a key focus of suicide prevention strategies over the last couple of decades, really reducing um, risk within services. But the main thing I want to talk about today is 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 safer communities. You know, how can the communities around that individual at risk, including the built environment, um, you know, act as a protective factor and 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 save lives? Um, so again, we've we've got around three quarters of people dying by suicide not in contact with mental health services, but they are in contact with their family, with friends, with colleagues, uh, with members of their community, with their football team. Um, so a lot of our work focuses really on empowering members of our local community um, to understand about the signs when someone may be at risk, to feel able to talk comfortably about suicide, to ask someone directly and, and to know where um, people can go um, to get support. So really you know, increasing the kind of confidence, skills and knowledge of our, lo of our local community. Um, so just some examples. This is a whistle top stop tour of our of our of our work. Um, a lot of our work focuses around training. We deliver a really wide range of training, everything from from simple thirty minute to sixty minute sessions aimed at um, community members, community groups, um, right through to um, kind of risk management training for mental health clinicians and everything in between. And um, in the first three years of our operation, we've trained, um, this is actually slightly out of date now, we're up to around um, 10,500 training places. Um, and we're reaching right across different sectors. We've worked with lots of local employers. Um, you know, we trained recently all the apprentices at BAE down in Barrow, for example. Um, Another really important initiative at the moment, um, which we think is possibly going to be one of the most important, is reaching into schools. So we're in the middle of piloting a uh, Suicide Safer Schools programme where we're, we're, we're taking really a holistic approach to kind of training the whole school communities around suicide prevention through pupils, staff, parents, and some of the other organisations that sit around schools. Um, we've trained around 2,000 pupils in the, la in the first um, two months of that programme. And, and that we see as an opportunity to affect a, a generational change in attitudes around suicide, of understanding of suicide and the confidence to talk about suicide and also reinforcing help seeking behaviour, um, that it's a, 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 a relatively common um, response to challenging life situations and it's OK to reach out for help. So the training is really important and we, we're expecting to train in the region of four to five thousand people a year going forward and much more school pupils as well. And the pupils were delivering um, a pretty comprehensive six hour programme to uh, around suicide prevention, self-harm, um, mental health crisis and also crucially peer support, you know, how to support your friends. Um, a lot of the work we do is engaging with local organisations and individuals. Since we started the charity, we, we, we've been overwhelmed by the, the desire of um, people in our local communities to affect a change around suicide. It's impacted so many people's lives, and I'm sure most of us in, 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 in this um, session today will have been impacted in some way, whether that's a friend, a family member, a colleague, someone we grew up with. And... Yeah, there's a real desire in our local communities to make a difference. Often people don't quite know where to start, though. Um, so we see one of our really important jobs is giving people the kind of the confidence and the tools, the resources um, and the training to try and make a difference. So it, it, it ends up in a, a whole range of local activities across across Cumbria. Um, Maryport Matters, which is a local newspaper, for example, we teamed up with um, we had four double page spreads about suicide in a, in a, in a local publication that went out to around 12,000 people each time. Really simple way of spreading quite um, useful information about suicide. 
Uh, we have been approached by various artists who put uh, murals up around the county. Um, we just, I, I also have to remember what slides are put in these decks, actually. This is a group of lecturers from the University of Cumbria who were particularly keen to raise awareness about suicide and about the importance of talking out and sort of exposing yourself and, you know, being real. And they also walked up Helvellyn in uh, speedos for us as well, which raised quite a lot of money and a, a lot of eyebrows. Absolutely fantastic day out. Um, uh, publicans in, sorry, um, landlords in in Barrow in Furness, um, you know, who'd lost quite a few um, of their customers to suicide, really wanted to do something. And we got together with them and did a Christmas beer cat, beer, beer mat and poster campaign. Even Santa joined in with that one. Um, and we work with individuals as well. This is Alison, um, who lost her son, Gary Jack, to suicide um, four years ago. And Alison's been on a mission, really, to, to help young people speak out. Um, so we've supported Alison with the with development of materials, um, again, of kind of like local hope murals. Um, we work with a variety of sports clubs. The Cumberland FA have been working with us for three years. Uh, we've trained lots of their coaches, their safeguarding staff. We've been in to give um, some more informal training to some of their clubs. We've had ongoing social media campaigns. We're working with Carlisle United, Barrow FC as well at the moment, um, and similar messaging out to their fan base. Um, uh, farmers networks we work with again raising awareness of suicide um where to get help um and working with local celebrities um again to get the message out wherever we can through the media this is one of our local uh, comedians dippy dickinson who did um some fabulous kind of awareness raising um videos for us reaching lots of people we wouldn't normally reach um we work with groups like chicks which is a campaign group in west cumbria um, of parents who've struggled to get their, their children into support after suicide attempts. Um, so we're working with them to develop a, a resource pack for parents and young people in A&E &A, A &E when they present with um, suicide attempts. So a really, really broad mix. And alongside that, we do a range of campaigning activity, again, aimed at um, encouraging people to reach out and ask for help, but also educating um, and giving skills and confidence to the um, general public. And again, a really wide range of activity. I won't dwell on those because we're really short of time. Um, and resources as well. Um, so we have um, delivered um, mental health and wellbeing booklets to every household in Cumbria on two occasions now, um, right at the start of COVID and um, January 2022 as well. Again, really helpful information about where to seek help, how to look after your well-being, um, but also in those um, two pages specifically about thoughts of suicide and how to support someone with thoughts of suicide and signposting information. We're absolutely chuffed we managed to get that into every home at a really critical time. Um, and we produce a range of other materials, self-harm safe kits, uh, which we've distributed around 5,000 of in Cumbria now. Um, and they're based at um, schools, primary, secondary schools, and youth organisations, uh, mental health teams, et cetera, et cetera. So a really useful at-hand resource um, for frontline staff, um, um, teaching staff, school staff. Uh, when they're presented with someone who's disclosing um, self-harm activity. Um, and alongside that, um, we worked uh, with the North East North Cumbria Suicide Prevention Network to develop um, resource tins, which we've delivered out across 1,200 locations in Cumbria now. So police stations, food banks, advice agencies, schools, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Key locations where um, you know the staff are likely more likely to come across someone having thoughts of suicide, and this is a this is a group of at hand resources, uh, you know, ready to give out to somebody who may be at risk or may be experiencing distress. Um, so yeah, they've gone through a really wide variety of places um, and are now being used regularly and being restocked um, on a regular basis. Um, so, yeah, a really wide range of resources going out into our local community 
um, at hand resources. Um, and leadership really trying to not just work at county level around um, um, more effort into the suicide prevention agenda, but also at a local level as well. Um, we run um, groups in most of the, the districts within Cumbria now. Um, some are, are, are activist led, some are um, agency led. Um, but again, you know, getting the activity right down into a local level and led at a local level and getting those conversations started at a local level. Um, and like I touched on before, postvention as well, making sure our communities are, are aware of the full range of support for people impacted by um, suicide and that individuals are able to access that support. And that's me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, loads of information there. Um, I'm hoping we'll be OK to distribute the slides afterwards and, and share those. Um, absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Chris and Mike, for that one. Um, moving on, remember to get your questions in the chat for Holly, uh, because there's some really good stuff in there that I'm sure that's got some thinking going. So our next our next presentation is Preventing Suicides in High Rise Buildings and Structures, a planning advice note. And this is with Toby Thorpe, Environmental Health Officer, City of London, and Claire Girau, uh, Senior Public Health Practitioner at Hackney. So welcome both, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for having us um, and thanks for listening to us today. I'm Claire Jo. I'm a <clears throat> City of London and Hackney Public Health uh, Officer and I'll let Toby introduce himself. I don't know. Toby? Hello. Yeah. Hopefully you can all hear me. Excellent. So yeah, my name is Toby. Um, I'm an environmental health officer at the City of London Corporation. Um, essentially, that means I'm one of the city's health and safety inspectors. And yeah, we're going to talk to you today about a planning uh, guidance advice note that has been produced at the City of London um, with specific focus on suicide prevention. Hopefully you've got control of the sides there, Claire. I, I'm, I'm trying, but I'm being spotlighted, so I don't know what's going on. Um, <laughs> you want me to take control back and move them on no, for you? No, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. I'm good okay. Sorry. Right. Um, so I just um, wanted to start by saying that, as I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, in the city of London Corporation, our mentality is that uh, suicide is everyone's business. Everyone can help prevent suicide. It may be by checking if your loved ones are okay, by working for the NHS or the police, or by designing out suicide in certain infrastructure, which is what Toby and I are trying to encourage people to do. Um, so just for context, um, as I'm sure, again, some of you know, there's about 18 suicides a day in England and Wales, but in the city, we have daily suicide incidents, contemplation, attempts. And uh, people travel in from everywhere to use the infrastructure of the bridge, the high buildings and the stations. Not only is this nefarious to the reputation of the site, but these daily incidents, they put great pressure on or great pressure, sorry, on our emergency services. So a big part of the public health team uh, remain is to prevent these incidents from happening by tackling the issue upstream. Um, so some of these key actions we can take are like increasing the eyes and ears in these locations, as well as reducing access to the means. And then I'm going to let Toby take over. Well, I was just going to talk a bit about the context. So we talk about the city of London, but I think it's worthwhile <laughs> conscious that we are from down south, so to speak, or certainly working down south. That we need to explain what we mean by the city of London. We work for the, the proverbial square mile um, that is the tiny little bit right in the center of london um, london itself is uh, has 33 boroughs um, essentially of which the city is effectively one of those um, and we've only got about 9000 10000 residents with a very very small residential population but as you can see this is an old, an old graphic our daytime population is immense this is from 2010 but it's the best one i've got to sort of put it in perspective compared to other boroughs in london we have people come from all over the southeast and and further internationally coming into the city every day and it was uh, around 400,000 daytime population in 2010 pre covid it was around a million 
um, people coming in for work um, and for tourism and with really easy transport links to get in. And so that gives us this position where we have lots of people coming from all over the place, coming into the city. And as, as Claire has indicated, it's not necessarily people who are residents of our borough who travel into the city to contemplate or attempt or even sadly complete um, suicide. I'm moving to your, the next slide. Is that all right, Tilly? Yeah, yeah. Um, so as I was saying, people travel from all over the city um, to use the infrastructure. However, that doesn't mean uh, suicide isn't preventable. So this is what Toby and I have been um, trying to work on. So as you know, interrupting the suicidal process can also buy crucial time for emergency uh, response to arrive. So this is what some of the measures mentioned in the guidance note aim to achieve. Um, so basically, as planning officer, uh, planning officers and developers and architects um, can now look at this gu guidance uh, we've created with Toby. And this is for any building with four stories or above uh, with some uh, public access and, you know, rooftop terraces, balconies, atriums, things like that, like where anyone can fall from heights, basically. And um, we wanted to, like, take responsibility as a local authority to equip people with the skills and confidence uh, they need to intervene. So we also mentioned training and other things in the guidance notes, but I'm getting ahead of myself, so I'm going to pass back to Toby now. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, just a little bit more context. Claire mentioned um, locations that are over four stories in height. And I think to put some context in here from a, from a planning perspective, conscious that many of you here will have that in your background or indeed your job description. Um, my colleagues in the development control team in, in the city planning have an open space strategy from 2015. You can find it online. Uh, most planning authorities do have public documents. Um, I've drawn out two paragraphs there that I put on the screen in front of you just to put the context of this particular guidance note. Um, and I'm, I'm not a planner, I'm a health and safety inspector, but um, the the City of London strategy, as, as I understand it, talking on their behalf around open space um, was a drive to secure better access to new public open space. And the net effect of that in somewhere like the City of London, where we have very limited um, location, it is the square mile. We don't have a lot of open space. It's pretty urban and pretty built up. And the net effect of that is that the planning strategy is driving public access to open spaces at height within the square mile into the future. So that's the foreseeable future for the city. And just in the, the years I've worked at the city, when I came to the city, we had the Gherkin, good old Gherkin and Tower 42. And the skyline has changed dramatically in that time. Um, and we'll look at some examples in a moment. Yeah. And 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 we've got, if we go back a couple, Claire. <laughs> yeah, so we've got an example here of... Um, 20 Fenchurch Street, uh, which is one of our iconic buildings, the walkie talkie, as, as it's uh, affectionately known. Um, it is but an example of the kind of spaces that are being made available to the public. So anyone who comes in from the southeast, from all over the place, can come in and come can access these buildings. Um, and this is this is a big one, a very tall, clearly over four stories in height. But there are plenty that are that fall within that category that you won't be familiar with. And if you have the next slide, Claire, we can see that the 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 City of London strategy um, around open spaces has been to push for these locations to have um, open space for the public. And they, they've been delivered through Section 106 agreements for public access, and it's involved these locations and developers needing to produce visitor management plans. Uh, and this one's again available um, on online so it can be seen as one of the the planning documents uh, that's available and it didn't ironically address suicide prevention this predates our our guidance although various aspects that are in this this visitor management plan do speak to elements of our planning guidance note and we are now starting to see that documents such as this, where you have, I don't know, maybe some of you have been to the Sky Garden. I should probably just just make it obvious from that tiny little picture in the middle of the screen. But there is a terrace there um, at the top of the building and there's a balcony that you can, as a member of the public, go out to for free um, with the ability to, should you be so inclined, attempt to 
to um, attempt suicide um, to all intents and purposes. There's a number of measures which make it more difficult, and that is the nature of the guidance document we're talking about. So um, if we move on to the next slide, we'll put the last bit of context in, then we'll get on to talking about the document and where this came from, essentially, this, this guidance note is that as has been indicated, we've had a number of suicide completions in workplaces in the city, be that terraces on restaurants or be that um, offices, essentially. And me and my colleagues in environmental health have often been involved with investigating those. Um, people falling from height is part of my other day job essentially with a health and safety hat on and since these are workplaces we often have some kind of regulatory involvement with them regardless um, and <laughs> it goes without saying that's why we're all here today it's kind of the you know, the, the nature of the the session and the seminar but building design clearly has a large opportunity to influence suicide prevention and so public health and my colleague claire there had started to become involved with pre-planning applications where they were invited to be involved. But that's time time consuming, didn't have time, time to go to all the pre-planning applications. And certainly me in, in health and safety and environmental health, we're not a statutory consultee of the planning process. So we were often becoming involved, but arguably too late in the planning process. Um, and as a consequence um, of suicide prevention objectives being formed by uh, our public health team, um, Claire and I started working more closely together and somewhere along the line an idea was born between us, we can't actually remember when, um, of coming up with some kind of uh, intervention process using the planning process as it is ideally located in the building design network, uh, um, flow I should say, sorry, for prompting suicide design interventions and it just so happened at the time that the city's long term plan was in the process of being renewed. So we came up with the idea for a planning note, um, I think in 2019, early 2019, and we had it written by the middle of 2019. And I'll maybe let Claire talk through how we got that to committee, because that was not straightforward. <laughs> yes, so as I'm sure some of you may know, with uh, dwindling funding available for public health, but also many governmental activities, um, even though the planning note was there, it was written, it was ready to go, between um, 2019 and 2022, it, it took a bit of time to go through the governance. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm, being, I'm gonna be perfectly candid. It took the death of a 13 year old uh, from a place of light in the city to get political momentum and get the note off the bar bar back burner and approved by the coming up, of course. But it doesn't matter, it got accepted, and now uh, we're seeing a lot of developers and, and um, architects engaging with us. So um, let's focus on the positive. But just in case some of you are thinking of doing something similar in your local authorities, um, it, it's yeah, it's not as obviously easy to adopt as, as it may seem to some of us who live, breathe, and, uh, and sleep suicide prevention. Anyways, um, so yeah, so just to uh, reiterate, the guidance was thus written between public health and planning, because this is department to be so part of, um, for public access spaces. The guidance is meant to be considered at the pre-planning, pre-approval pre of design stages. And um, what's very important to note, because we've had several architects and developers say to us, can you do a risk assessment? And I said to them, no, there is no way to be absolutely sure that suicide risk has been completely eliminated because again as i'm sure some of you know when there's a will there's a way um so that that, that that's another thing we'll touch on later is that um the, the the guidance does not lay out a statutory framework it's a non-statutory framework for architects developers and planning officers to consider because suicide prevention is part of the public health um objectives but really um, planning legislation lies with national government. So what the city has done by adopting this note is a political commitment to designing out suicides, but we cannot enforce this. Um, however, because of the reputational risk to these settings and these venues, we have found with Toby that architects and developers are very keen to engage with us. Um, 
well, and as I've said in my uh, earlier, I said we, we've said we can't offer consultancy on risk assessment. We, we will offer some advice, uh, but we will never, ever say, yeah, you've completely ruled out the risk of suicide. Um, anyways, I'm going to keep going. Um, I'm not as smooth uh, a talker as Toby, I apologize. So these are the four pillars of suicide risk mitigation in a publicly accessible space. Restrict access and means of suicide, increase opportunity and capacity for human intervention. Because it's all well and good encountering a, a fence or a barrier, but it's not going to tell you to go and see, seek some support for yourself. And then, yeah, increase opportunities for help seeking behavior and then change the public image of the site. Um, I'm sure some of you know very well about some cliffs, cliffs in the south of England. Well, it's the same in the city. We've got an issue. They or bridge are like this beacon. Anyway, um, I'll let Toby speak to these as well. Because Thank you, Claire. So the the those are the like, I, I see in the in the chat that links have been provided to the guidance documents itself, and we're not going to talk through it in a great amount of detail. You can go away and look at it yourself, and it is reasonably self-explanatory. But the principal idea is using risk assessment as a framework. Although, as Claire said, it is non-statutory, um, but the idea is to, uh, at the design stage, conduct a risk assessment to identify potential features or locations which could be used for the purpose of, of suicide uh, anywhere above four stories high and think about how people can get there and then think about what could we put in place that uh, either prevents or mitigates the risk of suicide and then, if possible, incorporate those those features into your design. And those are the pillars that we sort of, or the, the hierarchy of controls we'd like people to to work through. And um, it doesn't mean just do the first one and stop there, as it were. There's always a, a mix of these pillars that you can include. But if there are opportunities for restricting access to a location, <laughs> thank you very much for our warning. Um, then uh, you can. Uh, then please do so. So barriers, uh, fences, nets, hostile planting and the like. In terms of increasing opportunity, some ideas there are patrols, security guards, um, staff training, really important one. You know, anything which improves the time in which individuals at risk are identified and the capability of individuals at the site to intervene is improved. Um, I won't talk through the last two, conscious of time. Um, but we'll let Claire look at some of the examples we've got um, that are in the guidance uh, document if you yeah. get a chance to look at it. So what, what I want to say is that if you guys have questions for us on um, the nitty gritty of all of this, you will have our email, you will have the presentation and we will be available to answer your questions. We, we're very dedicated with Toby. So anyway, I'm just showing you a few examples. Here you've got a glass balustrade that's at 120 Fenster Street. Um, we've then got some very creative art installation slash weird pigeon spice in Canada. Uh, <laughs> and then you've got some of that painting on at 120 Fenster Street, which is in the city. Um, and then I actually have started working with a consultancy on a new framework. So when you look at actual physical solutions like nets, barriers, fences, I've looked at different criteria, which are the quality of the space, access prevention, obscure visibility of the water on the ground, because there's been studies about if they can't see where they're going to land, they don't jump, um, opportunity for delay, etc. I can't get into the detail of all of those. They are in the slide notes, but I am uh, in the process of getting this framework potentially published. But please contact me if you have any questions, if I can help. I'm, I'm not an expert, but I am trying to do some work on this. Um, and then, yeah, this is um, just things for planning officers to consider when they review applications, because initially this was meant to help planning officers and get, get them off my back, really. Uh, so the thing was ensure developers are aware of the reputational risk and the potential for translation into a real cost. Some um, rooftop restaurants in the city have had to hire security guards. They're not cheap. Um, there is no one size fits all, no perfect solution. So you've got to seek balance between the hard and the soft measures the hard measures are the barriers, the nets, the hostile planting. Soft measure is more increasing um, uh, chance of, of intervention. And then communication around suicide is very sensitive uh, because of the issue we've got as well is anytime there's a completion on one of those high rise buildings, the press gets wind of it. And then the next day we've got someone else up there. Uh, so we really um, drill in the fact that developers, architects, etc., need to be aware of the uh, Samaritan's Media Guideline, etc. 
And then we also need to make sure because the site operators are not the ones who design the site. So we want some engagement as well that uh, suicide awareness and prevention and uh, intervention training will be taken up when is relevant. Uh, and that's way past the pre-application process. So we just need to make sure that that happens. And then... Um... Well, so the, the, just the, la the last couple of slides. Um... <sighs> You'll be pleased to know, Chair, <laughs> getting, getting there. So does it work? I guess it's been in place now just over six months. Um, and it's all going to be anecdotal. How do you know if you, how, how many suicides you prevented within six months? We don't. Um, what we are getting is what we intended, though. We are seeing more conversations between developers and planning, uh, between developers and us, around suicide prevention, which was forever, forever the intention of, of this guidance. Um, so, well, it's a good question, Daryl. How are we evaluating? And I guess we can come back out to the questions at another time. It is, um, we've had developers come and say, like, how, how do I submit my risk assessment for suicide prevention? And we've had um, some misunderstandings with planners asking them to submit risk assessments for suicide prevention. And there is no, there's no template we can point you to. What we want is those conversations to be happening. We want those design considerations to be part of the bigger picture of you know, all the other myriad of, of variables that have to go into any design, new design consideration. Um, and it is a limited evidence base at the moment, but it, like Claire's already alluded to in the previous slide, that there is more work coming and there's more evidence coming and we will go through future iterations. And we'll see what starts to happen with the the small statistics that apply to the city. Um, and we do hope that future solutions arising from this will add to the the global learning that shapes how this goes. Yes, so there this we is go. A, a developing field. <laughs> And uh, and we're, we're, we're just adding our little rock to the edifice and hopefully it's helpful. It's not a rock that's going to make everything crumble. I need to stop talking. Anyways, the next slide is our contact details. So I'll slide that, but we had some takeaway message for you and uh, Toby will tell you. Well, that's it. I mean, thank you, but you can read for yourself um, where we're at. You've got a link in the chat and you've got a link there in the slides. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Um, this seems like an excellent forum and I'm very pleased that we were invited to share what work we've done. Thank Thanks you so for having much. us. <laughs> Thank you both. Honestly, that was brilliant. Thanks, Toby and Claire. Um, thanks for such an energetic, energetic presentation that uh, was just packed with information and really practical tips as well. So absolutely awesome. Right. OK, get your questions in. Holly, next one, the importance of place analysis in youth suicide preventative work with Charlotte. Um, Fidelius, uh, Faculty of Police Work at the University of Boras. Welcome. The floor is yours, Galata. Yeah, thank you. And I hope someone can help me with the slides because I'm not so used to using Teams. But I will just uh, thank you very much for the invitation to present my studies. And my study is conducted in Sweden. So if we go to next slide, I can just give you a very and next again. Thank you. I will just start with giving you a brief overview of my study. This presentation is uh, orange from my doctoral thesis. I did a thesis on rethinking injury events, both intentional and unintentional injuries in Sweden. Uh, I was trying to understand how can we use design in a proactive and preventive way? How can we design safer, but also how can we combine public health issues with architecture, design strategies and evidence-based crime prevention, since I have my background in criminology. Uh, and the study I was doing take was based on previous research on the relation between place and suicide from the 60s and 70s, because then it was a very, very big field in sociology and criminology to understand how does this works? How do you choose a place to commit suicide and things like that? And then we in some way forgot it. I also worked with theoretical framework work related to situations and situational decision making, what in this situation will influence your decision to commit suicide. I also worked with a lot of different mat material, mainly qualitative. 
I had uh, interviews with first responders, like the emergency service. We did what I called walk and talk. We went to suicidal hotspots and we talked about different events and what was happening. I did a lot of field observations. I was, I think, 18 months on different place, different time on the day, night and so on to understand the place. And I also worked with online narratives in terms of internet forums where young people discuss suicide and suicidal places that were effective in their mind. I also worked with YouTube clips, Twitter clips on farewell messages and also films that were taken off bystanders to suicidal events in Western Sweden. Today I will focus on some of the outdoor hotspots that I have worked with. And I always talk about suicidal situations because I want to include both suicide and suicide attempts. And I will also focus on what I call external elements in suicidal situations because I think we need to divide internal elements in suicides which are related to individuals like personal traits, motives, depression and things like that because when we talk about individuals we also see a very big great variation each case will be unique and it's very hard to work with design for unique persons because then we will have a very strange city so i have focused on what i call for external elements in suicide and that is related to place and method and i think in previous presentations today we have also seen that some methods are more used compared to others and also places so I think by narrowing it down to external elements, we can also be more effective than we want to work with design strategies. And I will also say something very short about my interest in youth suicides, because I found out very early when I started my research as a doctoral student, that when we talk about young people we always talk about them in as something strange and an opposite to adults adults plan young people are impulsive or use adults choose to commit suicide in private areas youth are more in the public sphere and things like that and that is really interesting why are we talking about young people like something strange or something different. So that started my own interest. So next slide, please. And what I did in my research, it was when we talked about suicide and I did my analysis of all this material I collected, I found out that suicidal situations in some way was a very broad concept that had different sub events or subtypes in it. So I constructed a typologic of suicidal situations. And as you see, I got two things that was important. It was the question about the degree of planning and the aim to disease. Do, does the person want to die of this act? And I narrowed it down to four different kinds of suicidal situations. One I labeled desperate suicides and this were mainly related to different institutions like detention home for young people, jail, psychiatric boards, something like that to use the outdoor area there. A very low degree of planning but they really wanted to commit suicide. The next I was I, I labeled para suicide, and uh, they had a very low degree of planning, but a primary aim, but no aim to disease, and this was often outdoor. And as previous <laughs> speech speaker for on like big heights or platforms, very in the urban region. 
And then we had the traditional suicide, a high degree of planning with a primary aim to disease. And I think that is how we think about suicide in every day that you are doing and you're planning and you pay your bills and you clean your apartment and things like that. And the last column I called instrumental suicide, and this was something else, and it's quite hard to really characterize, but they were well planned, but had another aim. Here I find extended suicide. Then you not only take your own life, but you also take someone else's life. I also find some cases of suicide by cop. And what I also called like revenge suicide. You're doing a suicide to get back on someone. My boyfriend was stupid and now see what you made me do. And all these types in my study occurred both indoor and outdoor. So it was something very interesting. But if you go to next slide, please. Then I narrowed it down and tried to look at if I have these types, four types, and I just look at places outdoors in the public, what can I find? What kind of special conditions? are reconnected to these situations. And this, of course, is on a very general level in the outdoor environment. But for all these desperate suicides that I find, the place also gave opportunity to commit suicide. It could be like hidden areas in backyards on different institutions that you hang yourself, for example, because you can hide or you can use a tree or something. The parasuicide was really connected to accessibility. It was places that was really easy to access. The traditional suicide had a special condition of effectiveness. It was very effective because you're going to die if you choose this place. And the instrumental suicide in turn was very strategic because if you want to take revenge on someone or provoke the police to shoot you, you need to be very strategic with what place can I use. And all these types could happen in the same place with a very small variation. For example, I'm very interested in, in trains and railways. <laughs> just say that so you understand my examples but a parasuicide it happened near the railway platform they use the platform to access the rail you just jump when the train was coming into the station but the traditional where you use the platform to access the track and then you walked to meet the train in the speed instead so that's also the difference between accessibility and effectiveness. Next slide, please. But if I'm going back to my main object here to understand young people's suicidal situations, I find the majority of young people in the cluster of Paris su suicide in the outdoor environment. They had a very low degree of planning and a very low intention to die and the suicidal situation was almost always a response to a rapid developed crisis. You had a fight with parents or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or you failed with something very important for you. And I think here we also need to understand and remember how it is to be a teenager. Because when we are teenager, everything is important and it's very black and white. And it took a while for me to understand that, that everything was so important and really a matter of life and death when you were 13, 14, something. Uh, and I also saw that the aim was not to die. It was the aim was to change this unwanted situation and stop the pain. And that was also really interesting to understand that the impulsiveness was not, I want to die. It was more about, I don't want to feel any pain. So it was a really crisis situation. 
also young people mainly used places that was well known for them. They have them for everyday use. And of course, it was very easy to access. And I think the most important here was also that place equaled method. It was not only a place and then you use another method. It was combined. It was jumping from heights using train platforms, train rails and so on. Uh, next slide, please. And with this in mind, I will give you an example from one of my study objects. I call it platform A. And platform A is very well known for the youths in this area. They use it to travel with train to school, to a city in the vicinity. This is a bit on the countryside. And they also use it to hang out in the evening since it becomes very isolated. It's not a lot of people that are there unless it's a certain time of day. I think it, this place lived up only mornings because people need to go to school and go to work. And then it was no one where, no one where, no one where. And then the afternoon came and people come back from work or school. So this was a very strange platform. And I'm sorry that the picture is not so good, but I think you understand the scene. And then I look at the statistics. This place had a suicidal, a lot of su suicidal attempts on evenings and mainly Friday and Saturday, because then the young people are using this place and they might have drank beer or something and got in conflict with each other. But then we don't have any adults. And, and this place is also very special because the platform is very accessible. We don't have any fence related to the to the train wrecks and things like that. So here we have a problem and what can we do? I think we can work in vis visibility. How can we see people when they are here? How can we attract people to this place? I call it activity support. Because this place don't have any station house or convenience store or something, we need to attract people that can contact the emergency, emergency service if something is happening. I think here we can also integrate the place in the area since it becomes a cut off. Of course, you don't want your house next to the, this kind of environment, but we can have like a the parking lot you can use for a food truck or you can have a small park for dogs and things like that. You can also work with the uh, lightning. This place had two street lights, but on evenings, especially at the autumn and the winter, it's quite dark. You can't see anyone. Even if you're standing on the platform, you can't see on the other side. Is anyone there? You can work with auto detect lightning if someone's entered the platform over rails. So you can raise awareness. Of course, you can work with fencing. You can also work with uh, some kind of CCTV that is active certain times of the day. Then you know it's going to be a problem. And also I think it's really important to work with emergency phones. The possibility to talk to someone in a crisis, it will give you other options. But also you can use it for contacting police or other emergency service if you see someone entering the tracks or standing in a special way with movements and trying to go on and off a platform. So it's a lot of things you can do. And the next slide, please. But to work with prevention, we also need to work with place analysis, I think, in a new way. Because I think the first thing we need to start to think about is that places are of importance. Suicides always take place. And this is, I think, here in Sweden, a very new way to think about it. Uh, 
Secondly, we need to work with identifying different hotspots, and I think we need to work with it in collaboration with different actors, because a suicidal hotspot is like a puzzle. The police has some information, the ambulance or emergency service has other information, the healthcare sector has some information, so we need to work in a broad collaboration and gathering different types of information, even if statistics are good, they are not always catching the whole picture. Uh, we also need to change our perspectives instead of thinking about why people are committing suicide or committing suicidal attempts. We need to think about where suicides take place and maybe also in a very micro geographic area to understand that we don't use the whole platform. Maybe we just use a bit of this end of it. We also need to think about time, when the suicide take place at a certain area, and also whom tries to commit suicide, the gender and age aspect, because we know that it's different between young people or young adults, and also about it's a difference between boys and girls. So we need to be very specific so we can understand this place. And we also need to explore what makes this situation possible to visit the place, work with pictures, trying to find in place related enables and facilitators. I think just to be at the place are telling you a lot about how it's used and when it's used and to really understand the dynamic. And when we have found this, why is it accessible and how is it accessible? We also need to work with preventive strategies. And here it becomes a bit complicated because we need to find strategy strategies which make it hard to access place, but still make the place functional for its intention. So how can we make a place safe, but not stigmatize it? Can we work with the place itself or should we work with some place in the vicinity? How does places affect each other? How can we find this balance? How can we work with, for example, nets on bridges? Can they be redesigned and include beautiful lightning? Can we work with fences near train wrecks with flowers and stuff like that? Because we want people to be there because we need someone who can reach out to the emergency service in worst case scenarios. We don't want to stigmatize place we want it to be functional, but we also want it to be secure. And here I think it's very important to also being creative and finding this balance. And at last, I think working with place and the place relation to suicide and place-based strategies sometimes leads to some kind of skepticism. I have heard a lot of time that if you secure one place, people will try on another place. But I, according to previous research, working with place and place-based interventions are effective and also have a very low degree of displacement because people very, very rarely change place. So thank you for listening. Right, our final speaker today, I'm delighted to introduce to you Neil Peters, who's going to talk to us about designing out suicide. Neil works for Suicide Prevention Consultants at Nuthatch Consultants. Neil, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. I'm just attempting to take control. Seems to be a bit of a go slow. Um, yeah, thank you very much for having me, everyone. Um, it's great to hear all the other speakers so far. Um, particularly impressed with those speaking not in their native tongue. I'm going to attempt to speak to you in my what my wife calls the South London mumble 
um, but hopefully I can contribute something to proceedings and um, I think the danger of going last is I might go over a bit of ground that has already been covered um, but hopefully we can we can add something to um, the proceedings as well. Um, just very quickly I wanted to give you a bit of um, my background um, just to contextualise where this sort of knowledge is coming from really. Um, my early career I worked in transport planning for the consultancy Mark McDonald and I worked on a range of local transport schemes, sustainable transport schemes and a bit of railway work and, and things like that. Um, and then I moved into the charity sector and ended up at Samaritans working primarily on their suicide prevention on the railway programme as well as a couple of other teams. Uh, so I was there nearly 10 years and then um, I left Samaritans a couple of summers ago and I set up Nut Hatch Consultants working on a freelance basis uh, trying to continue that work that I did at Samaritans but working with um, charities and local authorities um, uh, and businesses to work on suicide prevention projects and mental health projects um, so that's been my um, work over the last couple of years and um, you know, that work with Samaritans, I did develop a particular interest in, in suicides in prevention in public places and, and a, a bit of that work that I've done um, over the last couple of years has focused on that, particularly the work with Highways England and, and JLL um, uh, in East Sussex as well as uh, in the National Trust. Um, recently I've been joined um, by a former Samaritans colleague Katie Barton who's working with me on a project at the moment as well um, so we are slightly expanded now but I just wanted to kind of give you a bit of an overview of where, where this has come from really. Um, just try and move on, it's like going a bit slowly. Right there we go. Um, I think Claire touched on this a little bit earlier um, but sometimes when you're dealing with suicides in public places it's not always clear why you should be taking action or whose responsibility it is and particularly in certain areas is it's not always clear who's who owns the land or, or who can actually take action um but what i think has become clear certainly the conversations we've had today is that suicide is complex and certainly um you know the successful suicide prevention programs that i've been involved in or i've heard about um show that you know it can't really be tackled by one organisation. There's always different organisations involved, whether they have a specific suicide prevention remit or they're a local authority or they're a business or, or a transport organisation. And it's very much needs to be a, a multi-agency approach. And of course, we've, you know, those of us that are on this course today, you know, we understand that there's an ethical reason to, to prevent suicide. Um, I think a couple of people have already mentioned that, you know, by by reducing suicide or preventing suicide, um, it also protects staff and public services. Um, you know, it can put a real strain on emergency services, but it also protects people from, from the trauma of it as well. Um, thinking more about the organisations, there's often a reputational risk um, to sites and an organisation if it becomes known as a, a place where people take their own lives. And I recently did a similar presentation to uh, a group of consultants working in the environmental sector uh, and they were interested in how they might develop a business case around suicide prevention and and this might um, push some buttons with the guys in, in the city as well around how um, consultants can actually build in that sort of added value for clients by building in um, suicide prevention whether it's into a building scheme or a transport scheme or, or an environmental scheme as well. Um, so, you know, there's, there's different um, buttons you can push to kind of get um, people on board with this work. Um, these uh, points have been covered two or three times already today, so I won't, I won't labour them in detail, but there's clearly some strategic um, opportunities to reduce um, the risk of suicide. And um, we talk about prevention, which is kind of trying to reduce the number of people who reach that point in their lives where they actually want to take their own life. Um, so it's kind of upstream from that immediate um, public place. And that crisis intervention, which is often that last ditch opportunity to, to reduce suicide and that postvention side, I think it might be Chris that mentioned that earlier, um, where we, we know that the, you know, if you've been involved in a, a suicide or you know someone that's taken their own life, then you're at much greater risk yourself of, of going on to take your own life. So by reducing suicide, 
or reducing the impact of a suicide, you can actually um, potentially reduce the risk of suicide further down the line. In terms of the more tactical response, and this is something that's been covered by a couple of the speakers already, um, is opportunities to kind of reduce access to a site, um, uh, increase opportunity and capacity for, for that human intervention, increase opportunities for help seeking by that individual and to change the, the public image of the site. And um, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the on the restricting access side, but I'll, I'll cover the other, other bits as well in the next few slides. Uh, in terms of um, restricting access, there there's lots of different ways you can do this. Um, and it isn't just purely about, about barriers, but it, but it can be. Um, I've been working with uh, JLL, they're a pro big property firm and they have a range of retail, out, um, retail um, shopping centre type sites, um, some of them with multi-storey car parks and they've been looking at reducing the, the number of storeys, maybe reducing access to the top storey. Um, uh, I know Daryl's on the on the call today and we've been talking about potentially reducing access to, to areas of coast where there might be car parks. Um, fencing can play a, um, an important role um, and it's recommended that fences could be 2.5 metres high and, and curved inwards. So if individuals get beyond, um, even if they get beyond a, a fence line, there's still an opportunity to climb back, but actually that curvature makes it much more challenging to get over the, the barrier in the first place. Uh, safety nets, um, this would apply to the, um, the high buildings that were discussed earlier um, uh, and maybe bridges or cliff sites as well. Um, and boundary markings creating an almost sort of psychological barrier. This, you'll see this a lot on the railway around health and safety where they might be hatching on a platform, but it can also um, play part of um, suicide prevention. Um, even if it just means that people know that someone's in the, in the wrong place. But you can also demark um, other areas through lighting and vegetation or, or by creating pathways using natural features so that people uh, are more aware that um, either they're in the wrong place themselves or they identify others that might be in the wrong place as well. Um, in terms of um, external barriers, and I know this has been covered a little bit already, but here's a couple of sites um, on those JLL um, shopping centres that I mentioned. Um, the, the one on the left is an anti-climb, uh, sorry, anti-trespass fence. If you, if you uh, squint, you'll be able to see a Samaritan sign on there as well, which they had installed. I think these these are over two and a half metres high, these, these fences. And the one on the right is um, specifically anti-climb uh, fencing because beyond beyond that fence it isn't a sheer drop but there's um access to a glass glass roof there um so people are trying to climb onto the top of there also so also important when um these are installed as well that you don't create um other opportunities to access um the height in another way um some of the sites i visited as part of this program was um, you, there was a lot of sort of drain pipes or other smaller steps um, around sort of edges of fencing, um, which created opportunities for people to climb up. So some, there were some recommendations around this to um, you know, bo either box those in or find ways of reducing those those extra steps. Um, here, there's an in internal barrier. This you see this one's um, I think it's around chest height. I forget the exact. Um, height of this, but they'd had some attempted suicides from uh, a walkway within the shopping centre, and so they had increased the height of the, the glass uh, barrier um, to prevent um, uh, people climbing over, over that as well. Um, coming back to this more sort of natural environment, um, with this one being a, a cliff in southern England, you can see here that there's very um, easy access from the roadside to the to the cliff edge and uh, working with the local authority here we've been discussing opportunities to restrict access in a number of ways whether it's through barrier methods or through restricting access in, in different ways and the, uh, that road you can see there there's a number of laybys along along the way um, and often um, e there's a development either end of the road in terms of um, buildings and services, but 
um, there's quite a long isolated stretch where there's limited um, sort of public eyes on it, if you like, um, and a number of laybys where where people can walk legitimately to go for dog walks or to see see the view. But um, often those laybys are used by people um, who want to take their own life, and so there's been discussions about potentially closing those or creating additional um, site of those uh, laybys as well. And there's been other discussions around um, more detailed restrict, more um, I guess heavy heavy measures to reduce access to that road completely. Um, there's evidence from when the road was closed during foot and mouth that um, suicides really dropped off. So um, would there be an opportunity to close the road at night or create a tolls to have additional staff on the road to um, have eyes on, on that or maybe create a park and ride facility where um, you know, people are busting and so there's a, again a greater inter opportunity for, for intervention. Um, we've also talked about um, some barriers here. The, the natural environment does make it more challenging and you know local stakeholders don't necessarily want to impact on the view but there's been discussions around opportunities to look into that and potentially um, plant veg vegetation which will restrict access to the edge of the cliff. Just trying to flick to the next slide. I don't know if it's moved on your screen. It hasn't on mine. There we go. Um, I just mentioned there the, the planting of um, vegetation, and, and I know that gorse has been planted in, in areas in Kent to restrict access to, um, to a cliff edge, and that obviously has a more natural feel to it than putting up a large metal fence, but potentially. Um, this has to be done in the right way because potentially you can actually restrict access um sorry views of of the site so and the site i'm talking about um here in, in sussex um there's there are patrols where, who um, look out for suicidal people but actually um, where there's a lot of uh tall grass or other um, foliage between the road and the cliff edge it does restrict the view of those patrols so um you need, they need to be planted in a sort of um, synthetic way to ensure that they meet the needs of, of what you're trying to achieve. Um, going on to some bridge schemes, again, uh, um, this is to, um, helps with sort of sight lines. This is um, a bridge scheme in the Olympic Park uh, developed by Knight Architects. And Tom Osborne kindly shared these images with me. Um, you can see here, you can see all the way along this um, this footbridge. I think it's a footbridge over the railway. And um, so, so the nice clear sight lines, but also there's nowhere to hide along this bridge. There's no um, pillars or, or bits that are tucked away. Um, and um, also it's you know quite an aesthetically pleasing, pleasing bridge. You know, it's very many ugly <laughs> pedestrian bridges over the railway, um, but this one this one looks really nice. Um, and it's op open aired, but with high high sided. So there's, often people think about suicide prevention measures as being an ugly installation, but actually there are opportunities to be sort of empathetic to the to the um, environment that they're in. Um, you know, it's really important to design in opportunities for human intervention. I just mentioned there about the sort of vis visibility and reducing hiding places. I know um, Jane mentioned on the last um, uh, presentation around around CCTV and, you know, through the work on the railway that, that came up a lot. And I know the railway were looking at smart CCTV and thermal CCTV. Um, and I know there was a question in the chat about it's you know it's really important for it to be monitored and that, that's definitely the case. I know the railway were looking at opportunities for the smart CT, CTV to um, make alerts. Um, there's all sorts of um, ethical and moral decisions we've made around some of that about whether there's an automated response, whether it turns a light on, um, who reacts to that alert, and so on. But um, th those are opportunities as well. Um, and if you are requiring that human intervention. Um, you know, you, you must, must make sure that the people that are reacting to that situation um, are equipped to do it as well. We talked about training earlier in, in the day, but it's really important that you don't 
leave those people isolated without the skills to make that intervention and a process to deal with the person once they made an intervention. So training is, is really important and just creating that culture of encouraging people to look out for each other. Uh, and you know, helps to seeking builds builds on that. Obviously, from my background at Samaritans, we're uh, really encouraging people to reach out for themselves and seek help and talk to someone. There has been incidents of, of people installing emergency telephones at remote sites or, or, or high risk locations, and there's, there's pros and cons to that. Um, they can be misused, uh, or, or there can be challenges and where those those calls route to, but. Um, there, are, there is evidence that, that that could be an effective measure as well. You'll have seen crisis signage in, in on the railway and in other remote locations, and there's definitely um, there's some numbers on the screen there around the um, the impact of that. And um, you know, when we worked on the railway, we put those green crisis, what we call crisis signs, um, at, at key locations. But there's also um opportunities in public spaces to actually have ongoing campaigns not purely about reaching people in crisis but trying to get people before that and um i always used to liken it to um you know advertising for coca-cola you don't you might see advertising for coca-cola all the time but actually so that actually makes you think when you when you're thirsty oh, i'll go and get a coke but you don't need it all the time so having posters up around your sites encouraging people to look after themselves and seek help uh, before that they re reach that crisis point is re really important. This next slide just got a bit of data around um, the impact of these measures um, and hopefully it will come up. I'm having a few tech issues here. There we go. Um, I won't go through all the numbers here and there's, there's a variety of sources um, including some some from the NICE guidelines and um, the New Forest study, which is quite an old study now, but it is frequently quoted. Um, but you know, there's, there's a lot of evidence um, to show here that um, these measures, including physical barriers and sites with nets and CCTV and signage can have an impact on reducing the incidence of, um, uh, of suicide attempts at those locations. Finally, just wanted to touch a little bit on uh, improving the image of of a site, and uh, I wondered if Lisa Marzano might have been on the call today. But um, sh her study on the railway showed that um, you know by re redesigning and adapting a, an environment, um, it's a lot of a lot of um, railway stations do feel isolated and not very humane, and um, can be quite grim and run down, and that can can encourage. Um, antisocial behaviour as well as suicide and so by improving those environments it can really um, help it have an impact on suicide prevention. Um, this photo here is of the Foyle Bridge in um, Northern Ireland and again this is an often quoted site around suicide prevention and this was a site where there were a number of suicides and they've um, really upgraded the whole area both the bridge itself and I think the Riverside has become a sort of cultural and arts arts quarter. Um, and so they've managed to reposition this bridge as, and, ch and change its reputation. And I think the, the installation you can see in the photo um, is lit and changes color and is, is almost like a work of art rather than just a purely functional bridge. So, you know, people can change the aesthetic. There are um, theories that people can be attracted to these lonely and unwelcoming places, but equally others are attracted to beauty spots as well. So it's a challenging um, space to try and reduce suicide in. Um, but there, you know, things don't have to be necessarily spectacularly large installations like this bridge, but there are lots of small activities you can do. I'm, I'm aware of, I think someone mentioned in the chat actually about doing some graffiti um, artwork. And I'm aware of railway stations that have um, had art schemes from um, school kids. They've had sort of station adoption schemes where they've had flowers and planters put in and they've built some community value and ownership of those sites. And often when this sense of ownership or there's a sense of that this belongs to somebody, then that does reduce um, the desire to um, use that as a site to take, take their own life. So um, I hope that gives a, a bit of a flavour 
four of that. And I think that was my uh, last slide. Um, I had to I whistle, whistle through that a little bit, but hopefully that gives you a, a flavour of how um, suicide can be designed into particular sites. And um, you know, if anyone's interested in, in you knowing more about that, or you've got a site that um, you think you do support with, do, do drop me a line. I'm I'm on LinkedIn and my my emails there. So um, yeah, thank you very much for, for listening. Awesome, thank you so awesome. much, Neil. Thank Absolutely you so much, brilliant. Neil. Absolutely brilliant. Um, um, really good, uh, really, really good, good presentation there. And, and what a great way to round off what's been an afternoon of uh, fantastic sharing and learning. So absolutely awesome. Um, yeah, we've got some resources and training opportunities up there. Uh, I think it's really important to reinforce this. Um, you know, um, suicide can can touch all of us at different times. So, you know, these resources are here to help. And, uh, you know, I think it's been a really, really important afternoon this. Um, we may have some questions. We've got five minutes. Holly, have we got anything that we could ask the panel if we could invite the panel to uh, switch their cameras on and be ready to uh, field a question should they have arisen? Yes, I have got a couple of questions. That's OK. Right, I've got Holly one on bones. for... Yeah. Oh, here I am. <laughs> uh, I've got one for Toby <laughs> and Claire. Um, is there any thoughts or advice on dealing with suicide prevention in listed tall buildings where a barrier solution is not feasible due to structural or her heritage considerations? I'll take that on because I've just had to deal with it with uh, Tower Bridge. So uh, there are solutions. Uh, you can have some uh, offsets outboard or on board. So that means on the structure or off the structure and you kind of uh, deter away from the parapet or wherever it is decline. Um, I've engaged on, with Historic England on those and they were fine and we're talking Tower Bridge and this has to stay confidential by the way. Uh, and I'll have to share some desi designs if you if you want to reach out. But Tom Osborne from Night Architect, we've, we've been working with him in the city and he's absolutely amazing. He's very good at finding solutions that don't have too strong an architectural impact. So I'd say it's completely possible. I'd look at hostile planting as well. Uh, pigeon spikes, they're ugly, but they work. Um, yeah, but you, we don't have that much time, so please email me if you need more information. Thank you. Um, I've got one for Mike. Um, how do suicide rates differ across a year? Are there certain periods of the year where you see an increase? Thanks, Kelly. I, I had a go at answering that in the chat. We don't have any strong, reliable statistical evidence of a pattern over the course of the year. There's been some suggestion in the real-time alert system that Holly alluded to and, and described a bit, that there may be some increases in summer, but that's not statistically verifiable as yet. So it's, it's like so much of this area, it's it's um, wait and see. But as yet, I couldn't say confidently that there's a se any seasonality to suicide. Thank you. Um, I have one for Charlotta. Um, why do we not see many youth suicides or attempts at Beachy Head Cliffs, which is now the world most world's most frequent single suicide location? Oh, it was a quite tricky question, but I think that young people, since this is very impulsive and and this rapid crisis they choose these well-known places. I have seen this pattern in Western Sweden that you use a place you are familiar with. You don't travel or you don't move around. You, you're just using something that are so close to you. I don't know if it was the answer to the question, but it's just a very hypothetical thought. Thank you. Um, got a question for Jane as well. Um, how effective is CCTV as a suicide reduction measure? Well, for us, I think at Newton Cap, it was actually because it's a very, very dark um, place. So it's kind of a double edged sword, really, because we've tried to look at putting the um, the CCTV and the lighting in not only for kind of suicide prevention, but also for the traffic, the highway as well. So we've been told that obviously with the RTAs on there as well, because it's such a dark place that um, they, that would really, really help. And you have to kind of light up the viaduct to be able to see the the people with the cameras if you see what I mean so I think the two can't be kind of extricated really um, and that's why we've gone down that route. Thank you. Um, I've got one more is that all right Tim? 
Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> absolutely perfect timing, Holly. Go for it. Yeah. Okay. Um, one for Toby and Claire again. Um, have you tried putting conditions on planning permissions to mandate the ongoing management actions when the building is in use? Uh, no. <laughs> Easy answer. That was, that's a very quick answer. I would say there wasn't a lot of appetite for it from my colleagues in planning. It's not, you know, like I'm not a planner, um, but I would say yeah, it took three years to get a non statutory framework through. And that was the low hanging fruit. That was the easy win to raise the profile of the issue in a formal fashion. Planning condition, potentially one for the future. Uh, we've always said this is a developing a developing field. And so we'll we'll keep it under review if it can move on into enforcement. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you so much. Right, OK, we have literally about 30 seconds left. It's my absolute delight to say thank you to all our speakers today. You have been awesome. Thanks to Team Healthy Happy Places and Sarah in the background, Holly on the phones. Rachel, it is a fantastic introduction. Um, thanks to everybody who's joined us. If you've got ideas for further webinars you'd like us to talk about, get yourself some uh, feedback to us. We'd love to do that. Uh, and if you want a deeper dive on anything, uh, go for it and contact us. We're all on there. There's our contacts. What a fantastic afternoon. Uh, go in peace and happiness, everybody. And uh, again, the resources are there if you know people who are struggling right now or indeed it's quite a dark month in general in January. So everybody take care and uh, great to see you all. Thank you.